Indonesia sebagai negeri kepulauan yang kaya atas alam yang begitu indah, beragam flora, fauna dan juga berbagai macam masyarakat dan budayanya sering sekali menjadi daya pikat yang tinggi khususnya bagi orang-orang asing dari Eropa misalnya yang datang ke Indonesia, artis, penulis, dan juga mungkin ilmuwan dan antropolog untuk mendokumentasikannya dan bahkan tinggal di Indonesia. Nah, salah seorang yang sudah lama menjadi teman kepada Indonesia adalah Dr. Lawrence Blair. Ia dan adiknya Lon Blair telah memproduksi pada tahun 80-an sebuah seri dokumentasi bernama Ring of Fire. Dan ini menjadi salah satu film yang paling populer ditonton di seluruh dunia. Ya, Insight kali ini berbincang bersama Dr. Lawrence Blair di Bali, kediamannya, dan di mana setelah lama menjadi rumahnya. Di sini Dr. Lawrence Blair yang seorang antropolog dan juga pengembara masih terus membuat dokumentasi dan film serta... Hal-hal lain yang berkaitan dengan Indonesia, kekayaannya, serta bagaimana mempromosikannya khusus untuk masyarakat dunia. Lawrence Blair merupakan seorang antropolog asal Inggris yang kemudian tinggal dan menetap di Bali. Ia menulis sejumlah buku dan membuat film dokumenter tentang sejarah dan perubahan yang terjadi di Indonesia. Lawrence pertama kali menginjakan kaki ke Indonesia pada 1965, menghadiri sebuah konferensi di Jakarta saat ia tengah menempuh studi antropologi di Inggris. Pada 1972 hingga 1983, Lawrence mengeksplorasi kekayaan alam dan budaya di sejumlah pulau di Indonesia, antara lain Kalimantan, Sulawesi, Papua, Nusa Tenggara, dan Bali. Karyanya yang populer antara lain film dokumenter berjudul Ring of Fire yang dibuatnya bersama mendiang adiknya Lorne Blair. Film dokumenter ini mendapatkan penghargaan International Emmy Award pada 1988. Lawrence kemudian menulis buku Ring of Fire, Indonesia dalam lingkaran api. Dalam buku ini, Lawrence menuliskan tentang keindahan dan kekayaan pulau-pulau di Indonesia dan potensi bahaya karena berada di lingkaran gunung berapi Pasifik. Sebagai antropolog, Lawrence juga tertarik untuk mempelajari tentang penduduk suku di pedalaman Indonesia. Ia ingin mendokumentasikan kehidupan dan kepercayaan penduduk suku sebelum punah dan hilang ditelan peradaban. Grafiar di Kresnantio, CNN Indonesia. Ya, saya saat ini sedang berada di rumah Lawrence Blair di Ubud. Lawrence Blair beserta adiknya Lon Blair adalah penulis dan juga produser dari buku dan seri dokumenter Ring of Fire yang menceritakan mengenai perjalanan mereka selama 10 tahun di Indonesia. Dan Lawrence Blair juga pernah menerbitkan satu seri lagi bernama Miss Magic Monsters. Miss Magic and Monsters, Mysteries of Indonesia. Kita langsung saja berjumpa dengan Lawrence Blair. Hai Lawrence, Hai. How are you? apa kabar? Bagus juga. Hmm, sebenarnya Lawrence ini udah jadi udah jadi orang Indonesia belum? Belum, sesuai Masih coba-coba 37 tahun di sini. 37 <laughs> tahun, <laughs> tapi tidak ingin jadi orang Indonesia, Lawrence. Ya, saya internasional sekarang Inter sebenarnya. Saya tidak merasa seperti saya ada di rumah di, juga di Inggris lah. Mm -hmm. Bukan orang Inggris juga sekarang. Jadi merasa seorang warga dunia? Iya, warga dunia. Tapi lebih banyak merasa sebagai orang Indonesia, karena oh, iya, lebih banyak, mungkin saya. lebih paham mengenai Indonesia mungkin daripada kita-kita sendiri. Betul. <laughs> Lawrence, thank you for inviting Pleasure. me to your house. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about the story of this house and how you end up. Uh, well, this house was this really house. built preliminarily by my brother mm -hmm. um, in conjunction with our local village because, of course, we've been adopted by the village of Pengo Sekan and it was the head man of the village of Pengo Sekan, the great painter, mm -hmm. Batuan, Yoman Batuan. So what year are we talking We're about? We're talking then? 74, 
Okay. Yeah, so it was a long time. In fact, the first time I, I actually came to Indonesia in the year of living dangerously in 65, mm -hmm. but I was in a kebatinan in Chilandak. Mm -hmm. um, so we weren't allowed to leave the ashram walls. It was pretty crazy at the time. Then I came back with my brother in 1972, and we, with money from Ringo Starr, just mm -hmm. very little money to begin making this series. Okay, this is the Ringo Starr of the Beatles, right? Mm -hmm. Good friends of yours. Yes. So you moved in very, you know, circle of famous people. Very irresponsible circles. <laughs> okay, and, and then tell us what happened. So well, we came over here with very little money and with some simple cameras, and we couldn't leave the country for nine months because we were involved in such a series of extraordinary expeditions. We just couldn't get out. First of all, sailing with the Bugis mm -hmm. um, from Makassar all the way to Kepulwan Aru, mm -hmm. uh, which is where the greater bird of paradise was seen for the first time by a Westerner, by an outsider, mm -hmm. who was Alfred Russell Wallace, right, mm -hmm. uh, in the 1860s, who was the great independent co-discoverer with Darwin of mm -hmm. the evolutionary theory of species. Mm -hmm. But Darwin only spent two years on the Beagle, and he went back to the UK, and he spent all his time thinking. But Wallace was here in Indonesia for eight years, and he was speaking all the languages, many languages, and he brought back as many as 125,000 species of animals never seen by science. And so he was our great hero. Yeah. So we wanted to repeat that journey to, from Makassar to be the first people to film in color the Chendrawasi uh, in its natural habitat. So that, that was the beginning that of the, the beginning. desire. I mean, fine. How, how did you get hold of this book to begin with? Uh, well, that, that's I mean, not so. That's a famous book if you go mm -hmm. into the libraries. It's now famous. It wasn't so famous when we began it in the 1970s. Only specialists and experts in evolution could see it. But now it's in reprint. It's a very good book. It's a really good read mm -hmm. about and Indonesia. Of course, Wallace is a very familiar name here yes. in, in Indonesia. Now, we have yes. a Wallace Strait. But, and but, the Wallace Line yeah. and all that. But tell us the relationship between you, said that you were here here in the 60s, um, that was a very turbulent years, and then you came back again. But what was the initial connection with uh, Indonesia? The initial and then connection was really through our mother. We lived in Mexico. My parents mm -hmm. emigrated from England to Mexico when I was a kid. And it was at a time when people were interested in spiritual movements, mm -hmm. meditational events, especially in the West. And we were involved this in... This was a hippie era, right? The yes. Power power the... This was even a little before that, mm -hmm. that we, our family, was involved in a meditational group whose guru was in Indonesia. It was called Subud, yeah. probably mm -hmm. still known about. It's still there. And that's what first attracted us. So I first arrived as a delegate to a Subud conference here in the 60s, and I suddenly realized these were people who were aware in an area of sensitivity that in the West they just don't believe, let alone know about. And that's what conjured us into this world that I have never left. I lost my brother here, as you know, I lost mm -hmm. him 20 years ago. But it's surprising that anybody is still alive at all, because we lived a very dangerous time for many years, determined to bring back little snapshots in our mm -hmm. films of a completely different planet to the Western world. Mm. And, and, and for what it, it's worth, when the series came out, maybe I'm jumping ahead of mm -hmm. your questions, That's but when the series came out in 1988, and it was a big deal, it went out all over the world, da, 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 da. according to Yup Ave, who you will remember was yeah, the, Minister the Minister of Tourism, of Tourism at the then. time, mm -hmm. he told me that the uh, Garuda manager had said that their business had doubled in doubled over a two-year period after Ring of Fire came out. So in a strange way, uh, here we are watching Indonesia being invaded by hundreds of tourists, millions of tourists, which is exactly the opposite to what we really mm -hmm. intended when we first sent out. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 2016 yes. and completely different world, of course, now. You've, yes. You've seen the transformation. I've seen the transformation here, but I have to say there is lots of Indonesia that is still absolute magic and which is still very little explored. Mm -hmm. Let me rewind a little money. bit, Lawrence, because, I mean, the money, money. 10 years, 10 years in Indonesia, <laughs> I mean, it was a really, really long time. So initially, the idea to make a documentary about Indonesia, I mean, I know you said you, you read the book, but why did the idea of making a documentary about Indonesia come up? And what was really known then about Indonesia, particularly in, in Europe, in Very the Western? Little. Very little was mm -hmm. known about it in the West. And as you know, for, 
for many decades in America, certainly nobody knew about it, people would say, Bali, is that anywhere near Indonesia? Mm -hmm. They hadn't got a clue. Uh, so, in a way, it has been argued that this series, Ring of Fire, put Indonesia on the international map because it showed a vast land of mysteries, mm -hmm. which I have to say is still barely touched. I mean, there is, okay, we have a massive population, we? we've got whatever it is, 200, I think I heard Jokowi say something like 265 now million yes, people in Indonesia. Yeah. And yet... It's doubled, probably more than doubled than yes, when you first came here. Yes, but most of them still live in the West. And the eastern part of Indonesia is still very underpopulated with its massive islands. You've got enormous mm -hmm. places like Seram. And of course, I'm particularly interested in Papua Bara now, mm -hmm. which is a, an amazingly fascinating and unexplored place. Mm -hmm. uh, four documentaries. Uh, came out of the 10 year. And fi finally five. Uh, after after yes, the... Yes, after yeah, Lorne died. After Lorne died, there, yes. there was another one. So tell me what you remembered, the, the highlights of those 10 years. Well, I suppose one of the moments. great highlights for a start was because we began our journey on a boogie's prow, a prow mm -hmm. penisi, which is exactly how Wallace had sailed, and also with no engine and mm -hmm. with just the local guys and eating their food and living exactly the way they live. We've decided to go first of, up, first of all up to Toraja, Tana mm. Toraja. And it turned out they were just about to have the funeral ceremony of their last great king, Puang mm. Sangala, who had already been lying in state in his widow's room there for like two years mm. while the tribe got together enough money to be able to send him off to the stars mm. of his origins. So that was a mind-bending mm. experience to be up there for several months. Um, a lot of buffaloes were sacrificed, mm -hmm. uh, but it was an extraordinary and fascinating experience of almost the end of a dynasty, because it represented with this death the transformation from the old Indonesia with its many kings and sultans to what we're entering now. And I think we're still entering it now. You know, we, we, we had, it's, it's still a work in progress, isn't it? And I like to think that we're now the, uh, just through the doorway into an entirely new future for Indonesia. Mm -hmm. But I still weep for the things that vanish. But then who doesn't? Everybody's countries change. Well, at least you're lucky to have witnessed um, yes. you know, some of amazing, amazing uh, culture at that time. Um, Papua you also visited. Yes. What were your impressions then? Because for a lot of Indonesians, that area, I mean, even until now, it's, it's still a bit of a, you know... Yes mystery and, well, uh, well we stayed and my brother with two other people actually stayed longer than i did on that occasion but we went to the asmat mm -hmm. who were famous who are famous of producing mm -hmm. some of the asmat are they were at the time completely naked except for the stuff they stuck mm -hmm. through their noses and the major headgear but they were famous for producing the most valuable primitive art in the world mm -hmm. they were also famous for being not just cannibals, but also headhunters. You're usually one or the other, you're seldom both. And then they were particularly famous for eating Michael Rockefeller in 1962, no. who was collecting their art for the Peabody Museum, for the I'm Rockefeller Museum. glad you, you, you know, were not a victim. <laughs> we, had we arrived before Rockefeller, we would have been a victim. Mm. Because they only kill and eat people from a neighboring village or tribe who've already killed and eaten one of them. And it was the Dutch in the last years of late colonialism who were trying to put down a headhunting raid. They got overexcited and they shot four of their warlords, the Asmat warlords. So it's the first time the white man came into the cycle of revenge. And so they waited there for five or six years until this young, innocent guy came collecting their art because he loved the work they did. So he was a sort of a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. An unfortunate ending, but in a way, it's, a, it's quite a memorable one. But were they friendly? <laughs> do you, how, how, uh, how, do they, uh, how did you interact with uh, the local, the indigenous people? Um, do you know Lawrence, really were well? Nice to the, you, the, the, they the have... simpler, you might say the more primitive, though it is a politically incorrect word nowadays, but the simpler and more primitive the people, the easier it was for us to get on with. Mm -hmm. The people we were always frightened of were, of course, the officials, anybody who wore a uniform, they were trouble.
Mm. Did you, and get, did take, you encounter the, a uh, well, lot we, of because we, at that time it was, it was yes. the, still the transition and the new, the beginning of the new order. It was, it was indeed. Period. And you see, I, I'll tell you, I, I'll be frank with you, when we first came in, the government didn't like us making films of tribal peoples because they thought that showed a primitive side of the nation. They wanted us to film new bridges and new mm. roads and new ships. Yeah, it's all about and, pembangunan. Yeah, yeah they do. And we had to smuggle our equipment in, in different pieces, and then put it together afterwards, and then get as deep as we could into the forest. Mm -hmm. Because for many years, I mean, I, I'm a, a, an anthropologist, and what we were trying to do was, and my field is a specialty called psychoanthropology, mm -hmm. which is the difference, the range of the human mind. Uh, it's very popular nowadays in this mm -hmm. age of globalism to say we're all the same. But what's interesting about us is our differences, our strengths, uh, because we all have different talents, different tribal peoples, mm -hmm. different ethnic groups, different nationalities, different individuals, but particularly nationalities, have been brought up separated from each other and producing independent strengths and weaknesses. And it's the differences that are our richness. So for many years, uh, my brother and I were psychoanthropological mm -hmm. data gatherers, meaning trying to reach tribal peoples who had not yet been contacted by missionaries, who were usually the first, or by their own government, mm -hmm. who were usually the second. And so, yes, we had to interact with people, and our defense was complete vulnerability, because most of it was done with just two of us. So any hair-raising moments throughout your... Uh, you know, when you encounter you know, new places. Well, our boogies at one uh, point uh, tried to abandon us in the island of Banda, and we saw them sailing out oh over the horizon. What, what happened? What? Well, fortunately, the wind dropped. If they'd had a motor, we'd still be in Banda. But because the wind dropped when they came around the point, we could get into a canoe and we were rode very fast to catch up with them. Mm -hmm. We got aboard, nobody said anything, always very laid back and gentle, but we continued. But you know, no, with people, most of the people, no, I can't imagine, I can't really remember any really frightening mm. moments with people. But how did you communicate with them? I mean, presumably ha your Bahasa was well, not... Well, my Bahasa um, was not particularly good. Uh, Tapi Chukup, you know. There, was, chukup, there were always even the most together, tribal yeah. people. You would have one or two people with the asmat, very remote, two guys spoke Bahasa. And so, uh, but the asmat were very, unlike the Javanese or the English, who are both very reserved and are rather difficult to read. The Asmat and other peoples in eastern Indonesia are very extroverted, and their hearts are on their sleeves, so it's very mm -hmm. easy to understand each other. If they're angry, you know it, mm -hmm. um, and the other way around. But okay, other places like the Spice Islands, when you mentioned, and also, I mean, Ring of Fire, you were very near, you know, we were on Anak Krakatoa. Yeah. Uh, and how was that? How were the, the memories of when you and Lorne, still young men, a li little bit of a daredevil, yeah. risk-taking? We did some you know. very silly things, very stupid things, yes. <laughs> and one of them was filming, strange that Krakatoa well, first erupted in 1883, and then it erupted again exactly 100 years later, mm -hmm. in 1983. So we wanted to be there for that. Why? Because Krakatoa is very symbolic. It's the first time we realized that whatever happens in one part of the world affects the other part of the world. It was the first real hint of globalism, because Krakatoa affected the weather and the politics and the food of Asia and America. And so we wanted to show um, our whole film was sort of it needed that shot of mm -hmm. on Krakatoa blowing soap bubbles to show the fragility of the whole earth mm -hmm. and behind it Krakatoa that represented that all of it is one as well. But we did arrive at a time when, well, the government didn't want anybody to go ashore then mm -hmm. and the boatman dropped us there and took off. He was on the horizon, we could call him, you know, but he mm -hmm. took off from the thing. As soon as we stepped into the sand, we stepped in about a foot deep and it was hot, hot underfoot. But we had to get up to the lip, to the caldera, 
So we walked up there, and then these big stones are coming around, you know, big stones. So you feel like an ant in a rainstorm. Wow. And if you incredible. look at ants in rainstorms, they only sometimes get hit by rain. And you were not afraid at all, I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> not really. Even though you've been warned to get uh, out of there. Yeah. Yes, it was, it, was a, it was an exciting moment. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, most of, especially in, the, you know, in Europe, I mean, nobody's really heard of Indonesia at that time. And, um, and you lived in Mexico. I mean, I, I've been to Mexico, and it's, it's rich yes. uh, in culture and in tradition and in history. But... Were you still surprised when you arrived in Indonesia? Was it, you know, to your expectation after reading? It was even weirder Wallace's. than Mexico. It you was, know, even it was stranger I mean, than I'm, Mexico, because I'm by, by weirder than Mexico. Yeah. Remember, I came from 1950s England, which is not that long after the mm -hmm. war. It was very grey. It was rather miserable. Everybody was down at the mouth, mm -hmm. highly taxed. And my father, who was a pilot and bought and sold aeroplanes, he took us to Mexico. And for us, it was like the lid had been taken off. Mm. Blue skies, fantastic yeah. ancient civilizations, wonderful tropical animals, butterflies and snakes. So the same here when I got to Indonesia. I felt as if it was like Mexico multiplied by 100. Multiplied by 100. Yes. So it must have been yes. quite, a, you know, a, yes. made a huge huge impact. Now, ten years is a long time. What, why did it take ten because years? Because nobody would out? buy our films. We couldn't sell them. We were independent filmmakers. Every time we came back with the film that we said we would get, or something more interesting if it wasn't the same, and so we could raise money to go and make another one. And on it went, you know. No, we but what was the reason that nobody wanted to buy the film, even though you, you showed the, you know, all sorts of footages? Of because, it, for instance, in America, at that time, documentary film was considered to be educational film and therefore boring. In England, the only people who made documentary film or who showed documentary mm -hmm. film were BBC or ABC, one of the three channels mm -hmm. at the time. And unless you worked for them, you didn't have a chance of getting it on. So there wasn't really the outlet. And when we had finally got this vast amount of footage uh, of extraordinary things, it and was... How many hours of footage by the 80, end of it? 80 hours. 80 right? hours? 80 you could hours. have made, you know, like, you know, 50 doc series. Yeah, well, <laughs> documentaries. It wasn't all perfect. Right? <laughs> but we were shooting at a very small ratio, like one to seven. You know, you had to be very careful that what you sh shot was going to be used. And you were on 16 millimeters, so you were carrying with nearly a quarter of a ton of equipment. But in the, the 10 years, it's so you go back and forth yes. between Indonesia and Raise more money home. From so how much, altogether, how much did it actually cost? I mean, how much money did you have to raise? And I haven't could, added you it up, but I mean, you would not believe how little it was. I mean, I think we borrowed from Ringo Starr something like $2,000. How far did that take you? Nine months. Did you have to give it back to him? Did he? Uh, oh. Yeah, he, he, we did, actually. Mm -hmm. And he got it back. That, that, mm. that, that wasn't so bad. So that was only for the first part of the journey? Exactly. The subsequent really... stuff, the money then comes into editing the films, doesn't it? And produce, yeah, post-production. Um, I mean, looking back, I mean, you were then, the, you and your brothers, uh, young men, uh, how... How do you see yourself, you and Lorn, and you know, going out on this sort of boy's own adventure, obviously lugging equipment, which you wouldn't now. I mean, you can just no, exactly. bring your little you know, exactly. mobile phone. You can make a, yes. quite a good uh, yes. video out of it. I mean, how, looking back, how do you see yourself, the, the two of you? Um, well, it was uh, just life. We were doing what we loved. We felt that we were explorers, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were, it turned out. We loved it enough without thinking to suddenly find that we were actually finding things that nobody had seen before. Mm -hmm. Big waterfalls that have no names in the heart of Kalimantan. Mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. I know you said that you're both, you know, psychoanthropologists, but you know, when you shot and when you, was there sort of things that's going on in your mind like, oh, I'm shooting this because I want to show this, or I'm shooting that because, I mean, or did you just? No, our how, how did you was approach what really yeah, interested us. The difficulty, of course, before you can raise the money, you had to write a story of what you wanted to find. Mm -hmm. And then when you come 
get into the field, you might find that it isn't there. It's impossible to mm -hmm. film. But you have to find something as good or better to take back home. And so we were just like crazy dogs that like extraordinary smells mm -hmm. and found that there are real things behind them. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but it was inquisitiveness mm. that Sniffing drove us Sniffing out new things. Inquisitive. Mm. Yeah. Inquisitive. Do we have that's a word for that? Yeah, ingin tahu. Tinggi, gitu. And uh, did you, but did you feel the, the historical context yes. because you are following the footsteps of you yes. know, Wallace? Did of you course. feel that? Of course. Burden of mission. No. And you know, it may be in Europe, I think we are taught at school, we have a stronger sense of our own history than we do in Indonesia. It's not as if people know so much about their more distant history in Indonesia. That's why, for instance, Wallace's little house in Ternate has now disintegrated and is difficult to find. Whereas it would be a very good idea, the government should really be putting that together mm -hmm. right now because that is a marker of the vital history, Indonesian history, of what happened. But we had already a sense of history. We read the original books. We took mm -hmm. them with us. 1860, Wallace's book, where he describes a certain type of mosquito that you find in Ambon. Mm -hmm. And we were reading that when we were in the prow in Ambon, and a mosquito comes through, crack. There it is, the Ambon mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> After 10 years, I mean, of course, you, you came in there with some kind of a preconceived uh, idea from your yes. book, and also you have the the culture shock or wonderment, but after you know 10 years, what did you learn about Indonesia and the people and the, the wealth of so much natural wealth during your journey? And how did it actually affect you as a person and as an academic? And well, I was deeply affected by the kebatinan that I came to. Yeah. Um, and it was enabled one to get into a sort of a meditational space that made it much easier to communicate with people, even if I didn't speak or they didn't speak any Indonesian. You could put yourselves in a state and you were there together. And you knew exactly what was going on and an enormous amount comes out of being in that sort of space with other people. I can only describe it as a meditational space. And there are tribal peoples who are arguably in that meditational space all the time. They haven't been necessarily meditating under mm -hmm. a guru as a poor Westerner has to come and do, but they do it from the word go. The Balinese mm -hmm. have that a lot. Um, and I was very close to the village here um, in the past, as was my brother. And uh, so there was a sense of, of brotherhood at an internal level. How did you get on with your brother what was your relationship like with him especially you not only your brothers but you're working That's together right. you're it was like a marriage we loved mm. and hated each other <laughs> so um, you know and we how are you different temperamentally close. tell me he, he he was the responsible one. Oh, really yeah. i'm just the word man the dramatic guy mm -hmm. but he's the one who was really the filmmaker he had worked for bbc i'm an academic mm -hmm. and everything about filmmaking i learned from him I was his assistant, mm -hmm. dog's body, as they say, and therefore I only shot 15% of the movie. But I did the, all the sound, I did the stills, mm -hmm. and I did the story. But he was the, the tank. He mm -hmm. had tremendous stability. And you see, David Attenborough wanted to buy all our film. Whenever we went back to London after an expedition in Indonesia, he would mm -hmm. come round to the flat uh, wanting to see our footage. And then he would want to buy the footage, and I would have been happy because we were very broke for many years. I would have been happy to sell it to him, but it was my brother who said no, because, and he's quite right, because we wouldn't have had our own series afterwards. Um, so he was a very s solid and lovely guy. I was extremely close to him, mm, and I still miss him a great deal. Must have been very hard losing him. But we were temperamentally different in so far as I, I think I, I mentioned in the book, uh, he, he can go for days and days without eating, and I can go for days and days without sleeping. But I have to eat a little bit every so often. And uh, so we were like... Uh, so day and night, really, the polar opposites. Yeah, opposite. sometimes you had to go day and night. So we were opposites, um, but the opposites were very complementary. 
Mm -hmm. At which point would you disagree? I mean, you said it's like a love and hate relationship. And... That's a good point, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think he's more likely to say, stop, we're not going any further, mm -hmm. that's getting dangerous and stupid. <laughs> and I would say, let's go further. It's not dangerous enough yet. It isn't stupid enough yet. Okay. Other than raising the fund, you know, what's actually the biggest challenges in, that you faced in your trip in what, 10 years of going back and forth and trying to... Well, probably before doing our Kalimantan trip with the Punan Dayaks, first of all, months in Jakarta, getting signatures, getting the papers, oh, the red tape. Rocks. We did everything yeah. chop-chop that time, mm -hmm. and it was a nightmare. It's not surprising so many people don't do it the right way, because it's so difficult to do mm. it the right way. Did you actually have to bribe yes. and yes, bayar bayar? Yeah, tapi tidak begitu banyak, because mm -hmm. we chose the way of patience. It's like getting your driver's license even today. Either way, you pay somebody else to go and do it, or you go through the patience of doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. But even then, you pay a bit. Mm -hmm. And then when we got to Kalimantan itself, we had to find this tribe of nomads. And very difficult to do the because Punan. we went right up uh, from Samarinda up the Mahakam River, and then you begin taking tributaries up with speedboats. The speedboats' engines break, and that means you've got to come all the way down hundreds and hundreds of kilometers back to find another speedboat, back to go up another way again. The greatest challenge. Uh, in many respects, was simply having uh, the determination to carry on until you find what you have promised your investors you're going to find. Mm. Finally, the BBC, 1988, agreed. What, what happened? I mean, what, how did you, well, you manage know, it was to really WG, It was PBS, the, PBS, Boston, PBS who picked it up, and then they got the BBC. You know, you're never mm -hmm. a prophet in your own land, <laughs> as it were. And so it was the Americans who picked it up and said, this is fantastic. And it was WGBH Boston, particularly. And uh, they put together this thing. And remember, as I mentioned, uh, documentary film was considered educational, therefore boring, mm -hmm. therefore not commercial. But David Fanning, who ran Frontline for 20 or 30 years, was our producer. And he says, I think we can make this work. And we put it together. And it was such a success that they say that Discovery Channel opened uh, six months afterwards because they suddenly realized they could make money on the truth. After all, what is more extraordinary than the truth? Mm. Were you happy with it, with the results? Were, yes. you, were, were oh, there definitely. things that you definitely We were happy. so happy because it resonated with so many people from so many different nations. You know, we've shown on 60 countries national television all throughout Latin America, through the Middle East, in Russia, in parts of Africa. And um, it was just lovely to get the feedback that all these people, I mean... Yeah, what what are mainly the feedback, the reviews? Well, well, the, the, <laughs> well the feedback that it was a true adventure. And I, and I like to think mm -hmm. that it's because it was about people. And uh, we do it not as, I think, sort of 19th century chest-beating yes, adventurers, you know, like, but we did it you know, the, with the humility. The the colonialists, you know, experiments. No. The, the humility exactly. was It was, was a certain hu humility and, and, and a feeling, as I genuinely do feel, for instance, the tribal primitive peoples are every bit our equals and in many ways mm. are superiors. But remember, I come from the era of the hippies and their philosophy was to equality of all people, compassion and love for all people, and that everybody has a great treasure in them that we don't necessarily mm -hmm. know. Did you make a lot of money from... No, I'm uh, still broke as a skunk. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, no, no, I never know quite how, where it's coming from next minute. We have been, it has been such a success. But you see, my brother was really the businessman mm -hmm. of the crowd. So losing him also means one's lost most of the ability to corral my work. It's all over the internet. It's all over places which I can't actually control. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could stop it. But then I decide, if I'm not making any money from it, how pathetic of me to stop it. I'd rather people saw it. We suffered to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather it was seen and that it touched people. And then what, your brother pass, passed away yes. in 1995, yes. in Bali. He passed away in Bali in 1995. He fell down, you know, I don't know if you've ever tried walking in the streets of Bali. It is very dangerous. And uh, he was 
less than 50. He was two weeks short of his 50th year. year. So he wasn't an old geezer like mm. me, but he nevertheless fell into an open hole in the street down in Legian, broke his leg, and he died two days later in the local hospital because they didn't give him an anticoagulant. So he had suffered from a stroke, which is a stroke either from a blood clot going into his brain or marrow from the bone going into his brain. So it was, if you like, bad luck. But then we'd had so much good luck on our truly dangerous mm. adventures that maybe it all works out. Did you feel the irony of it? I mean, oh, you course. crossed, you know, Awful. rivers, the mountains, yeah. you went to the and erupting been, volcanoes, yeah. and for him to and pass away. And we'd been three months in Kalimantan, where walking with Dayaks, at least, mm. Uh, but walking where it was really dangerous, where you could not afford to break a leg. They say that's the worst thing you can do is to break a leg because we can't carry you out. So try not to break a leg, they told us, and then he breaks it down here. Mm. But that's, uh, that's um, I mean, I rationalize it by saying that uh, I don't think you can bring your death on and I don't think you can postpone it. I think you just have mm. to live your life and through to it. Must and I guess have, yeah, must have been we a were shock, so lucky yeah. anyway. Must Horrible. Have been a shock, you know. But then after, after you, you made mm. another one, like a yeah. series for Sky TV, Mysteries of Indonesia, with Dr. Lawrence Blair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There is a myth that uh, Laura Kadul has her nine handmaidens, as you know, her mm -hmm. uh, Putri Duyung, and they're sometimes associated with gems that are blue-green gems. Yes. That's and why they, you don't wear yeah, your greens. In that's suit, right. Just in case. And they say that you sometimes know when the queen is passing under your boat on a quiet night because you can see these blue-green gems. Okay, the brightest fish in the world is in Indonesia. It's a little fish, it's that long, it's found in the Banda Sea and it has cheeks which are so bright they're like a five-watt bulb. You could read a newspaper by them. But they live at least 5,000 feet deep. But once a year, they come up to mate near the surface in a very remote part of, of, uh, uh, of the Banda Sea, mm -hmm. off a reef. But if you're there at the right time, and it's a dark moon, it has to be no moon at all, you suddenly get these lights. Whoa, it's like the aurora borealis of the tropics. Never been filmed. So the first film about Loro Kidu is trying to film them, which is what we succeed in doing. Wow. And then we have another film about snakes. And the snakes is about the symbolism of the snake, the naga and all that, and uh, the, the, the uh, kundalini force, uh, mm -hmm. how it is found in the philosophy and spiritualism and mysticism of Indonesia, and a look at the snakes of Indonesia, which are fantastic from little tiny things that pretend to have two heads, you don't know which head is which, to the pythons that eat man. And we finish up going into caves with enormous pythons in them. What, that, that's what are the monsters? Okay, that another do? thing we discuss is strange primates. Um, and uh, uh, Orang Kerdil mm -hmm. from, uh, from Flores, and also the Orang Pendek, which is a mm -hmm. symbol and a myth that is found all over the world, but is quite strong in Southeast Asia. And of course, these guys were here until um, the Orang Pendek, Homo floresiensis, mm -hmm. believed to be here as recently as 12,000 years ago. I mean, that's when we, Homo sapiens, yes. you and I were around at the mm -hmm. same time. And he was one meter tall. And so their babies were this big. And they hunted pygmy elephants, which were as big as a cow, but it was a, like an elephant to him. They hunted Komodo dragons, which were much bigger than the ones we have now, seven meters long. That would have been a real dragon. Mm. And they hunted giant rats. Now, for some reason, Homo floresiensis, the giant Komodo dragon, and the pygmy elephants are gone. But you and me and the giant rat are still here. And in Flores, you've got the biggest rat in the world. That, Tampa Ecornia. Mm -hmm. But the Lawrence, did you feel, as you shot all the myths and magic and monsters, did you actually feel the, the vibe, the, the mysticism, the mystery and the wonder that, that yeah. is Indonesia? Oh, yeah. 
That's why I, my yeah. job has been to try and interpret to the world that mysticism and magic and wonder that is Indonesia. Um, Lawrence, you've been, you know Indonesia so well now with um, four decades, I, I would yeah, say. I still and only touch the surface. And only touch the surface, yeah. but how has it, um, how do you see uh, your compatriots or, or people outside of Indonesia, particularly in the West, their view of Indonesia, has it changed? Uh, how has it evolved? And also the view of Indonesians about themselves. Do you notice a distinct... It's a difficult, it's a complex and difficult yeah. question that. Because a, a lot of people, as soon as you well, become as a an, tourist, an outsider, yeah, if you go anywhere as a tourist, you risk not enjoying it. Mm -hmm. If you go there as an individual human being going to a foreign country and you're completely open to it, you, you, you're going to have some wonderful times. You may have some bad times, but you're going to feel the real thing. But if you come as a tourist, you know something like 90% of the visitors to Bali still never leave their beachside hotels. And even fairly recently, you know, they didn't have, that's what I love about Nusa Dua, they built it as a tourist ghetto with that great big, you know, gate, traditional gate, much bigger than you'd find in a temple, bigger than a Pesaki, and a uh, big wall about it. It was, the idea was to keep the tourists down there so they wouldn't mess up the rest of the island. Very good idea, worked very well for 20 years, but now the dam has burst and there is great pressure on just this little island, I would say, uh, great pressure on the very things, on the very magic that is what draws people here. But what keeps you here? I mean, you know, ninth, well, since what keeps me 1972. Here is I still go, I do expeditions, I still, I've just done another film, we did a film recently called Bali Island of the Dogs, about the, about the Bali other story, dogs. but it's, uh, it's, it's because I can travel on boats, which is what I do, I take private people on expeditions to remote parts of Indonesia. It's an opportunity to research and to dive, which I love doing. I love being underwater here all the time. I am underwater a lot of the time in Indonesia because we're finding new and extraordinary creatures. And it's not just what they are, but it's what they mean. This is still a place, rather as it inspired Wallace to present the world with a new vision of who we are evolutionarily, these secrets are still here, still waiting to be discovered about what we potentially are inwardly as well. Mm -hmm. But what has changed, do you think, in Indonesia intrinsically? Because you, you mentioned earlier with a little touch of, you know, sadness, I mean, in those days, the, you know... Of, little nostalgia. Yes, it's this nostalgia, but now, I mean, uh, what's, what's missing about the in, you know, about Indonesia that you kind of regret, but what well, are also the new and wonderful the, things the, the, the that The thing that I'm regretting forward? most is because I came here to show the wonder of Indonesia, a lot of the wonder is being chopped down, and a lot of the coral reefs are getting destroyed, and the, there's that same boring old story, and all these plastic bags are everywhere. Yeah. So it's very important that we don't chop any more forests down because there are all sorts of creatures, not only the orangutans that are really at risk, they have nowhere else to go because of this palm oil plantation, but there are many areas where we just don't know what the creatures are. There's a place down in, in up in the Raja Ampat Islands where we used to go and show them this bird of paradise, this particular type, Wilson's bird of paradise, red, blue, green, black, little tiny, crazy, brilliant bird, like a permata in the forest. Mm -hmm. And an airport was being built, a small airport, but every time the airport got longer, every time it was getting closer, last year I went back, you can't see the bird of paradise anymore. Why? What's the priority? Tourism, nature, or Kemajuan, you know, they have to be balanced. So the balance is not always perfect, to say the least. Mm. But can we not have all these things? But and yet, yes, you could you have all these things in perfect balance, absolutely. And and you know, for all Australia's drawbacks, 
Uh, one thing they're really good at, I find, when I go down there, is that mankind lives with nature right there. You have all these amazing birds and creatures right there, no trouble at all. Not so easy here in Indonesia. A wall is being built between them. Mm. Elephants of Sumatra, another great concern of mine as well. So the friction between humans yes. and nature is much more yes. clearly felt now. Yes, it is. It so is. for example, millennials, you know, the, those born after 1980s, yes. you know, they come across your book. You know, what do you uh, think would they of understand the book? it? You yeah. tell me. I don't no, know. No, I mean, Maybe I mean, not. What would what would you be, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, be telling them? Uh, uh, do you think it? Because you have you have seen how Indonesia has mm. changed. I mean, we're now in a democracy. Mm. Uh, we're now, uh, you know. I mean, look at the Jakarta. I, was, yes. I saw the film in 1972, yes. and you know, it's, it's so different yes. now. What can you say about the Indonesian psyche, since that you're a psycho? Well, I, I like to think that you still have the potential to have everything. You've got the most amazing physical nation on the planet. You have more varieties of human beings, ethnic groups here, than any other one nation on the planet. And you're a nation of seas. Now, sea is the blood of life. The second blood of life is volcanoes. So you have 34% of all the world's active volcanoes, which are the givers of life, fertility. And you have this massive variety of not only humans, but of natural creatures all living together in a soup of cohesion and balance and harmony, with the exception of human beings, and particularly modern human beings. The reason I escaped the West to come to Indonesia is because we felt the pressure of concrete buildings and big business. Mm. Now, Indonesia is going in the same direction. But they could do what Australia has managed to do, which to have big concrete banks right next to wonderful jungles of fantastic birds and animals. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I'd like to tell the millennials. Mm -hmm. But they might not understand this anymore, because they only read sort of 20 characters at a time, don't they? I mean, maybe I'm being a bit unkind, but I don't think millennials read books much. They're dealing with another form of communication altogether. They can do all this um, high-tech computer stuff very efficiently. Um, your next project, um, still on Indonesia? Do yes. You, is, is Indonesia going to be basically, this is it yes. for... No. What, else is, what else is there for you to document, discover, to share with everybody? Well, I tell you, I'm working on something. Um, have been for a little time, which I'd really love to do and would have longed to do for a long time, and it would be called Beneath the Ring of Fire. And it is exploring with deep submersibles what has never been seen. Mm -hmm. Because this is a very deep, deep seas around here, full of fascinating things. Because it's the most volcanic nation, there are many fumaroles down at the mm -hmm. bottom. And that means that you have life around it, which is being run driven by chemosynthesis rather than photosynthesis, and every single island is different underwater of chemosynthesis. There's a vast amount to be discovered, big creatures, whole worlds that we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. And it's all in Indonesia. And I think a great deal of it. Of, we have only looked at 5% below 10,000 feet around the world. 5%, that's all. None of it in Indonesia. So I'd like to be part of exploring that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Lawrence, one day, I mean, is this home for you? Is this where you're going to be oh, spending yes, yes. the rest of your oh, life? Oh, certainly. I mean, I go back to, to England occasionally, but I feel much more at home coming back here. How, how would you describe your relationship with it? Is it a, sort of like a never-ending love affair or is yeah. it a constant discovery of the mysterious things that yes. is... There are great frustrations living here. I mean, uh, as an Indonesian, as well as a oh, yeah. bule, as you can imagine, even more so. Um, but those are nothing compared to the richnesses that I derive from living here and exploring here and meeting people. You know, I love Bali because I meet people. This is a true connection between East and West. Hawaii says it's between East and West, but that's absolute nonsense. It's all been taken over, really, by America. But this is a meeting between East and West, because you have all sorts of interesting thinkers who come here. 
uh, as well as all the pop stars, of course. Yes, actually. well, <laughs> now, tell me all your, you know, the David Bowie, Mick Jagger, <laughs> and Richard Branson. I mean, <laughs> just well, I sort of knew them back in England at the mm -hmm. time, you know, it was a big deal in the 70s and the 60s. And funnily enough, when my book, Ring of Fire, came out, mine and my brothers came out, and the film series came out, whenever it was, 88, Mick Jagger gave his friend David Bowie for Christmas the book and the film. And Bowie gave Christmas uh, Mick Jagger the same thing. So they both exchanged mm -hmm. it as a Christmas present. So when they came here, they looked us up, and we were their sort of, you know, guides, I suppose you might say. And then um, when but, but How did you get to know them to begin with? I mean, before they were famous, no, or did you grow up together? Hit, no. no, afterwards. And then I took Mick Jagger and Jerry Hall on uh, an expedition, on a trip, to back to the Azmat, where they'd eaten Michael Rockefeller. Very good. It was great fun. Great fun. Well, Lawrence, you're really an asset in Indonesia. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. I like Who to will so. you bring? More famous people? Well, uh, whoever to... you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had Angelina Jolie once, I, uh -huh, I remember. Yes. So, well, like I said, you're, you're a great promoter Thank of you. Indonesia. Yes. And, you know, for you to come up with, you know, the Ring of Fire and Myths, Magic and Monsters, <laughs> I really think these are works of love and uh, only a little bit of madness yes. and dedication can actually produce something like Thank this you. and I think it'll be an amazing legacy and and also you know especially for Indonesians I mean I think so Lawrence thank, thank you, you so much so for nice. allowing thank me you. this wonderful home of yours thank you in Bali. pleasure to have you here <laughs> yeah demikian bincang-bincang kita bersama Lawrence Blair dan tentu saja kita tunggu hasil-hasil karya Lawrence berikutnya yang bisa dipastikan akan lebih banyak memperkenalkan Indonesia ke dunia luar, tapi mungkin yang lebih penting lagi kepada kita-kita sendiri di Indonesia. Dan mengingatkan kita juga untuk harus lebih mengapresiasi segala kekayaan yang kita miliki. Demikian insight kali ini, saya Desi Anwar, sampai jumpa, bye-bye.